Love it. All of us are, um, have unique timelines, and we're on a timeline. Amen. I'm going to use the word timelines, but I could also use the word destiny, destination, purposes, calling, all of those things. But I want us to see what the Bible says. If you're on a timeline, and I don't mean timeline in terms of the chronos. We know that there's, there's actually three, three different words for timing. But not a chronos, so we're keeping time by the clock. Or the fact is uh, the horeos, which means the change of day that we see, uh, literally means right timing. But it's actually the sikairos, which would be more the season of. There's none of us that have an expiration date stamped on our behind that says, you know, you're going to die here. At least I've, I've been looking, I haven't seen it. <clears throat> I've asked Diane, she hasn't seen it, so I'm good. I haven't sometimes looked back there, but... She keeps me checked out. <laughs> we'll discuss this later, I'm sure. <laughs> Too much information. But I can tell you that you have nothing stamped on you saying that, you know, you, you're just waiting till you die. It's a terrible thought and idea is you're just waiting around to expire. But when you became born again, there's something happened. There was a timeline started at that moment that the Bible says in, in 1 Chronicles 1 that you were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. There was something started on God's calendar, that's kairos, meaning open season, that started things moving in your behalf. According to John 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. A thief has only one thing in mind. If a thief breaks into your house, he's not there to leave milk and cookies for you when you come home. He's there one thing, and that is not only to, to steal, but to steal or disrupt your timeline that God's put you on. And I'm going to quickly run through some things concerning uh, some people in the Bible, and we'll make some application here, that every one of you, and you'll be able to see, when you were born again, God started a time on you. And the enemy wants to war against that timeline. When God had called that there would be a deliverer coming out from the people to deliver, to deliver the Hebrews out of Egypt, Moses was born, and he was born in a time when the Pharaoh was killing all of the firstborn male children of the, of the Hebrews. The enemy was warring against the time and the time schedule line that God had intended for the, the Hebrews. Even in the middle of that problem, God had someone there ready Moses' mother took her out, cared for him, even in Pharaoh's house. And God, right under the nose of the enemy, raised Moses up that one day would be the deliverer. Pay for his education everything. Jesus was on a timeline. In fact, he even told his disciples in, in uh, Matthew, he said, he began, Matthew 16, he began to tell them after he told Peter, I give to you the keys of the kingdom. Making that statement about the kingdom of God. And the next verse, the Bible says, and Jesus began to tell him, tell them what was beginning to happen. Now I want to read this verse to you in Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time that Jesus released something to them, the keys of the kingdom of God, something started happening and changing. For all of us, we might remember a point in time things begin to shift. And when it began to shift, you can start seeing disruptions all along the timeline to disrupt you from what God intended for you to be and do. Not everybody's called to be up here. There's times that I thought, man, it'd be much easier to do something else. But you're called in your family, you're called in a city, you're called in the nation, you are called and put in position your light and life wherever you are. And there's always a warring or resisting against what you're called to do. Now, if you've had an encounter with the Lord and you know that you were born again, you can find, if you charted it out on timeline, that there was interruptions of resistance to what God called you to do. Or, this is what Jesus said in verse 21. From that time, something started at that moment. There was a Kairos moment, there's a Kronos moment that he, he said to them, and he said, from that time on, it started a season or something moving 
that began to operate towards God's destiny for them. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples, not just tell them, but show to them that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. So it wasn't a surprise to them at all that Jesus was going to be killed. And notice that he said, and I will be raised on the third day. But how many of them remember that even though Jesus had told them that, when he was crucified, they ran away, some of them hid out, and they were in mourning and did not want to embrace the idea, but he had already told them, I am on a trajectory by the Spirit of God to accomplish something. And what appeared like the devil did something, then it wasn't God who, who, who in, tried to interfere. Notice the next thing was, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. How many ever had friends? You don't know what you're talking about, but they don't know that you're on a trajectory or a timeline sent by God. Because it doesn't line up with their uniqueness or their timeline, they get upset when you're moving in a different way than they are. Some of you even had to pay a price to come out of a, a denominational system or a very traditional system to embrace something that, was, that, that had a spiritual dimension to it. And you got criticized for it and rebuked for it and all kinds of things. Now listen. He even told them, I will be raised the third day. Even told them the timeline. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you. This isn't going to happen. Here is Jesus, the prophet, the son of the living God. They've already declared him to be. Jesus had given them a keys. You can imagine all these things, but there was still something in Peter that said, I don't like the timeline. And he took him aside and said, it's not going to happen to you. And Jesus rebuked him and said, get behind me, friend. Did he? Come on. You that are scholarly, stay with me. He rebuked him and said, get behind me, Satan. Their enemy is always warring to trying to chop off the timeline or the trajectory we were going. If you went back into the life of Joseph, he has a dream. He has this in incredible dream of the Lord. He tells it. Now you can debate whether it was, it was great wisdom should he, should he have said it. But he went from there into the pit. He was sold into slavery by his own brothers. Yet... He, all he had was a dream that God had him on a trajectory and a direction that not even Joseph fully knew. And so you look at it and said, God, if you were with me, how can I find myself in such a mess? I know a lot of friends that's not in the mess like I'm in. But not all your friends have been called to lead a whole nation. And so sometimes the trajectory and the timeline that we go through things, we don't understand that the end and result of this is going to take us through things that's going to, to get, make us a good steward and give us the capacity to rule and reign when we get there. Because what gives us the capacity to do great things for God is our ability to tolerate pain. And I'm not talking about physical pain. The pain that your brother sold you into slavery the pain of rejection, the pain that people left you when you thought they were with you, the pain that things didn't go the way you thought they would, or you, your expectations. Remember, an expectation or a disappointment is a preconceived idea that wasn't God's. But yet you're still on the timeline. You're still moving that direction, even though it doesn't look like things are going your way. The Bible says that though man makes plans, yet it's God who leads his steps Passion translations takes his steps to know how to get there. And there's nothing wrong with planning. We make plans, but you know if your life is hidden in Christ, then the steps that happen along the way, though you didn't plan on them, yet God is still directing you that way. You know my story, how that I never planned on going where I did the first church. And the pain that I experienced there... And the rejection I went there, even feeling like God was punishing me, I was on a trajectory so that I would be able to experience what it means to set other leaders and, and the captives free. Amen. I didn't know anything about the spiritual witchcraft. I didn't know anything about that, but I was thrown right in the middle of that. And I had no books, nowhere to turn except God. He walked me through those steps of that point. 
Jesus was on a trajectory. He knew who he sent from and he knew what he was going through because he knew the end result was be raised third day. But he was releasing to the family of God authority that would later on set free generations yet to come. So I want to look at real quickly this morning your timeline and the timeline you're on. And I'm just going to refer to a number of scriptures because I don't have time to go into all of them. And then uh, we're going to do some ministry at the end. So if you need to wake somebody up around you, just tell them, wake up because something's getting ready to happen. <laughs> some people, they just get so used to when they sit down all of a sudden, shoop, their minds, you know. I have a great a kid one time told me, he said, I love your preaching. And I said, thank you. He was, I don't know, he's four or five years old. He said, I can sleep best when you're preaching. <laughs> <coughs> Glad I could help. You can't sleep at home. I'm your answer to, to narcissism, you know, narcissism, to, you know, being, being the fact you can't sleep. And you got insomnia. Well, nep- narcolepsy too is what I was doing. <laughs> narcissism. Narcolepsy was the word I was looking for. All right. First Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision or the ability to see, so the people perish, but the word there is actually scattered. When you can't see where you're going, that means that you will deviate from the plan that God's called you to be. Now, all the plans and all the direction we could, we could take time and look at it here and with everybody, and we would recognize that every one of us is uniquely and fearfully and wonderfully made. And it doesn't mean that one calling and one gifting is more important than another. It just means that you're responsible to walk with God in such a way and go through the things you need to go through to get where you need to be. And if where you need to be is the fact is that you're just a great worshiper, a great mom, great dad, you're great in the marketplace, you love people around you, that is honorable before the Lord. I'm not talking about FIFO ministry, giftings of standing up and preaching in front of people. Your destiny and trajectory that you walk with God, that you please the Lord, the Bible said, and he will even cause the enemy to be at peace with you. So he said in 1 Chronicles 12 verse 32, we, it's familiar to us. And this is really related to when, when David was at war. And he said men started gathering to him. These were men that had special giftings, opt, warfare ops, if you will. And it said, the sons of Issachar, they knew the times and seasons, but they knew what to do. They realized the time right now is, is to go to war, but the season, we don't know how long it's going to last or what we're going to do, but we just know the right thing is right now. There is a time when I have to say, I'm ready, Lord. I suit up and say, this is it. It's a starting place. When, when you were born again, you were taken out of darkness into light. And I'll have another part of this that when you are on a trajectory of God, you operate in light, but the very thing that the enemy wants to do is bring darkness to hide where he's taken you. The ability to overcome darkness and resistance very well is the how you finish and finish strong and finish well. When you're born again, you start something happening, your spirit is awakened. Your mind now is saying, I have submitted myself to God. Now we're on this trajectory. The sons of Issachar knew the times and seasons, but they had knew what to do. There's wisdom in the middle of that, that prophecy going through that. Jesus said in John, the fourth chapter, verse 35, he's talking to the woman around the woman of the well area. And he said, don't say there's four months and then the harvest. Because they knew exactly the chronos time of the harvest. So Jesus comes and he said, don't say what you already know by the natural timing. But yet I'm telling you, the harvest is ready right now. So having the, having the, the I am in your heart saying, God, I'm going to follow you. Then it's, the natural doesn't make sense. You go through things that doesn't make sense. You can't compare it with someone else. But you simply say, I know whom I believe. And the harvest is ready. I'm going to move in even though it makes no sense to me. You can't become whatever you're dealing with. Your gifting it can't be compared with anyone else. All right. Um, so in your spiritual timeline, God knows how to get you where you need to be right when you need to be there. I was, I was raised pretty stubborn. 
In fact, when I, before I went to school, I told my, my mom and dad, I said, I don't need school. I know everything I already know right now. And dad laughed at me. First day of school, I said, I'm not going. They thought I was joking. Everybody was ready, got in the car. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I wasn't going. I was seven years old, and I was not going to school. I got a spanking so hard that I went and sat and cried half the way to school, walked into a place that I've never seen with people I didn't know, and I was just scared out of my mind because my life had been so hidden in a bubble with my, my, my siblings, and that was it. I never have gotten more than two or three miles out there. So next day, guess what? I'm not going. Day number two. <laughs> I got a wearing out again. And I sat there in the car and wept all the way to the school and went there. Day three, same thing. I didn't realize you went to school all week. <clears throat> Somewhere down the line, I thought I could wear my dad out and we wouldn't have to get there. He said to me, son... I will spank you every day of your life until you graduate, <laughs> if I have to, but you will go and you will do what I'm calling you to do. So I had, a, I had a lot of stubbornness in me that had to be broken to get on the trajectory and the timeline I needed to go. God has uniquely prepared things for you in your path. Now, does God bring, cause everything to, around that? No. We're a product of our choices. We're a product of our offenses. We're a product of things that we don't like. We're a product of opinions. We become products of, of you know, we're feeling, get our feelings hurt. All those things can slow down and derail the timeline God's called us to. You can be upset. You get a spanking tomorrow, but you, you know, it doesn't help you anything. You keep pushing back on it, resistant, and you're going to not have, you're going to deal with it again tomorrow. God is not in a hurry, but he's really consistent. Yeah. We can look at some of the same things in, in the life of um, Samson. Samson was called to be a judge and a ruler of the nation of Israel. He had a vow with God, an Azarat vow. You know the story. His hair was long. God said, this is, this is a sign or a symbol. So if you can't grow your hair long, doesn't mean that you don't have a covenant with God. I mean, he, he, he's looking at the heart. And so as Samson, he knew that he had this place with God that God was calling him and had the authority to rule over, the, over Israel. Somewhere down the line, he got involved with Delilah. Delilah's name is translated in the Hebrew as the feeble one. When you get involved in something that God didn't call you to, to do, you will become feeble, at least in the spirit. And he played around with it a while because he became so used to God's favor, became so used to God always being there. And you know the story, how that the Philistine, she was a Philistine, and they, they told her that I want, we want you to seduce him and find out where his strength lies. He was very unusual. He was amazingly strong, not as a normal man. He would play around with her and tell her, so if you tie me up with green, green uh, rope, then, then I'll just be like any other man. So he did that, and then the Philistines came out, and he broke them, and he lied to her. And he goes on and on until Delilah keeps working on him and working on him. All the while, he thought he was in charge. But the enemy had one thing in mind, and that was to steal his relationship with God and to set, cut short the trajectory of the timeline God had called him to. And finally, the last thing he gives in to them, tells them about, you know, that if you cut my hair, I'll be like any other man. And he did. There's some things that I can't pray my way out of. Amen. The choices that I make, I cannot pray my way out of them, but I can pray my way through it. Yeah. I have to, I go through it because the choices I make and the influences I've allowed in my life doesn't mean all of a sudden God's going to get you out of there. No, you made the choice, but I will walk you through. I'm not saying it's over, but what we have to go through to get there. And he can take all things and cause it to be beneficial to those who are loving God. Finally came, you know, the story, they cut his hair off 
And he became like a normal man. They blind him. They make a mockery of him. The very thing God called him to do. And it set him on a timeline. And his destiny was to rule over the nation of Israel. And make the enemies fear God. And now he was a weakling. He had been seduced by a spirit. Lust. And he lost what God had called him to do. God was with him towards the end. Finally, you know the story, God, if you'll give me strength one more time. God validated the end. He repented and he brought the whole house down upon the 12, the 12 lords of the, of the territories of the Philistine. So God did have, break, have a breakthrough there. But it was not what God intended for him. Some of us here today, we've been on a trajectory with God and something happened that shortened us, stopped it. In fact, Paul mentions this in Galatians. You began in the spirit. What happened? Who has bewitched you? And the word bewitched there is the word python. Python means wrap itself around you and slowly, slowly, slowly. Some of you can go back to something that somebody said. If you were able to look at it and say, man, everything was going good. And then somebody said something. Somebody did something. I remember talking to a lady, it was, I was probably 15, 20 years ago, hadn't seen her in a long time, ran in the store with her, I said, where have you been? I haven't seen you. She said, Pastor, I love you, I love the church, I love everything about that. I said, where are you? Well, there was, a, there was another lady in the church that came up to me and said, is that the third time you've wore that dress this month? She said, I couldn't go back there anymore. I mean, she was a strong person to worship. The enemy knows how to push our button to stop or derail us from the trajectory that God's on. But part of it going through the pain and going through the rejection, going through the offenses, is that every time you move past that, you become tr- more, your face set like a flint, you become stronger in your resolve, you become stronger in the anointing, and those little foxes won't spoil the vine any longer. You just keep breaking through and breaking through until these yapping little dogs on the side over there are still yapping, but you don't hear them anymore. (laughs) Someone once said, if you kick at the pesky dogs all day long, as a mailman, you'll never deliver the mail. And so we get so bent out of shape of such small little things, and we get bothered by it so much, and the capacity to to growing in is do not let the little foxes spoil the vine. To the, our capacity is to the level of our pain or the level of the resistance that we have towards these things. So if you find resistance, it may be part of your own choices. It may be part of what the devil, and he'll take advantage of it. But the end result is if you've been stopped on your timeline, God knows how to put you back on line and get you where you need to be. Number one, you start out by, I have to stop blaming someone for my timeline of being stopped. Stop. Somebody said something, somebody did something. I have to stop that and begin to turn my affections towards the Lord again. When you turn your affections towards the Lord again, it means that I'm looking to him as the one who called me out of darkness into light. It's him that I'm looking at, not people. If I have to have people telling me how great I am all the time, and I like that, then it means that I haven't broken through the soul barrier. To break through the soul barrier means I'm getting past what other people feel or think about me to the point is I am now more in fellowship with the Holy Spirit than I have to have fellowship with one another. I'm great for the socialization and all that. Some people go to church simply for the socializing. Not that shouldn't be them. I mean, that's part of it. I'm not saying it's bad. But you begin to say, I want to be fed by the Spirit of God. I want to join myself together. Even if it means going through some pain, even if it means going through some resistance, even if somebody comes up and says something about what I'm wearing, say, praise God, at least I got one. <laughs> you break through that. You penetrate that soul barrier, which is an emotional, feely thing. Third thing is, One of the big things that can stop you from growing on the timeline is criticism. Criticism about others, criticism even about yourself, is you stop that growing because you're resisting what God said about somebody else or even about yourself. 
It's easy to be, because the word criticism comes the word critiquing, which means now I am a judge. I'm critiquing. I'll give them a three. You know, it's the Olympics. I stand up, you know, and, no, you didn't do it right. I'll give you a two. So we're critiquing. So when we start critiquing, whether we like the song that David sang tonight, ah, today, you know, I'll give him a four. There's always another time, you know, you know, we gave him a shot for trying. Then I'm critiquing. But it stops the timeline. But if I'm on a trajectory that by the Spirit of God, I'm, I have the vision, Lord, that those, you know, if we see vision, that if we don't see vision, we are scattered, we perish. So I'm seeing the vision of the Lord, not trying to find a position and place with everybody else. Amen. If you need somebody to tell you how wonderful and great you are, and that's good, we, we should do that for one another. But I'm telling you, to know the Lord, those who know the Lord, they'll do exploits. Part of our moving forward in the, on the timeline is just recognizing Life is not going to be fair because there's people who are within it. Life is not always going to produce what I want it to be. My wife or husband, whichever the case is, they may not always be what I want them to be, but I'm going to still walk with them. When I realize that God's put, put me on a trajectory and a timeline, the breakthrough through every one of those obstacles leads you closer to the authority and the power to accomplish what you need to see done. Now, can you imagine if Jesus knew he's on the timeline and someone could talk him out of it? He said, I came from the Father, I'm going back to the Father. When you have vision concerning God's, what he's called you to be, you don't make, the Bible says, you don't make excuses for the flesh. You just keep moving forward at that point. I want us to look at, because I'm, I'm coming to the end of the short message here. Can you remember a time when you were derailed and you stopped? And for a while, it seemed justified and reasonable. Or the fact is, I've hit the age where God's through with me. That is an easy lie from the enemy. Because you're serving, not unto man, but you're serving the Lord. So it's the fact, Hebrews 12, 25, forsake not the, the, the fellowship or the assembling. Part of being connected to a body is the assembling, every part coming together, learning how to walk together with someone in such a way, rubbing elbows with someone, even when they rub you the wrong way. Thought a few of you would say amen about that. <clears throat> I don't say it might be somebody close to me. Part of that is it would be much easier not to have that, but we learn so much by being around one another. We learn so much and by faith and imparting to one another. When I hear you worship and I hear you singing, and someone right next to me, there's, there's some faith enters my heart. We need one another to help us get to that place where we were. When David conquered Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. He went from being a shepherd boy that all of a sudden there was a trajectory that changed his life. The whole nation was delivered and set free because this one 16, 17 year old boy all of a sudden began to obey God because it was in his heart to move forward with that. Even though his brothers around him told him, says, I know what you're in your heart. You have selfish ambition, and I know why you came here. David had to break through what his brothers and those around him thought about him. Otherwise, he'd shrink back. Well, I just came up to deliver some food for my father. I'm just going to deliver that and leave y'all, and you guys can have it. But because he was on a direction of the Spirit of God much more than even what David knew, David had to break through that and even went to the king. And the king tried to put his own armor on him, but that wasn't David's call. That wasn't David's armor. And he had to keep pushing his way through till finally he was operating in the gifting and calling of God that he put there, which is just give me a few rocks and sling and I'm good to go. One reason is because David was not around the influence of the trash talk of Goliath. Amen. 
He spent time in the shepherd field. He spent time with the Lord. So when it came time to confront the spirit of Galal, which is translated there, to strip and take your armor from you. Then David wasn't moved because he had more input coming in from the spirit of God than he had coming in from this, the social society around him, which is his brother. David makes this statement. When he looked at his brothers, he said, is there not a cause? The word is actually translated, do, do not we have history? David said, I'm going to think back of all the history that God delivered our nation, that our fathers told us all through the time, brought out of Egypt, and now we're in this land, and here we are, our God, Jehovah, can do anything. And yet you're, you're just spellbound by this one guy, it's pretty good, this one guy that's trash talking you and making you fear him and presenting you pictures of what, I'm getting, what he's going to do to you. If you don't have a vision, purpose, what God's saying to you, then the enemy will transplant its vision, what he's going to do to you. If the devil can say, listen, I'm going to feed your flesh to the fowls of the air, and you believe that, it means that you, first of all, had an impartation of what God said. Because God said, you're going to the other side. God said, you're going to break through. When you keep in mind the last thing that God said, then the next thing the devil says is not going to have that much issue with you. When David defeated Goliath, cut his head off, all of the armies of Israel ran out and defeated the Philistines. That's not the end of the story. That was simply part of the timeline because David went from there to being king. Had to go through some stuff with Saul. Went through some rejection with Saul. Saul was mean to him. Saul was uh, afraid of him. Saul said things to him. He was pushed back from it. Can you imagine if you had this call of God in your life and people were saying, you're going to be king, you're going to be king. And the one who stood in your way was, was trying to kill you. And yet, God would, didn't allow the plans until God said. You're on a trajectory. When you trust God for the, the feet of where you're going, then you don't worry about the time. Because I'm on time, in time, in the right season. If I've stepped out of time, stepped away from God, then everything halts at that moment. But if I'm in time, obedient to the Lord, doing everything I know to do, I'm moving in time on his schedule. Instead of one, God, you need to hurry up. It doesn't feel right. This needs to happen. This needs to happen. And we throw out our laundry list to God. David now becomes king. He said that a successful reign. And then 1 Samuel tells us, chapter 4, 4 and 5 in there. And he said that when the springtime came, when it came time, time again, for kings to go out to war, David stayed home. He's been right in timeline, right in trajectory, but something happened in David's heart. You know, I've done this so long. I've been faithful all these years. It's not right that I have to go out and do this again. And when he stopped there, he begins to see Bathsheba. You know the story on the balcony. Because his attention and his direction of the timeline God put him on was distorted. And the enemy came and warred against his timeline towards his destiny. Who moved my cheese, if you read that book? David is so captured by it. He is king. In his own mind, I can get by with it because I own everything. I'm over everything. He goes and takes Bathsheba. He, now he's committing murder because he has his, her husband killed. He has now moved from the trajectory that God called him to be in. David couldn't build the, the tabernacle. Next to the steps in Solomon, his son. Solomon did great. He's, he had the fear of God. He said, God, I don't know how to come in and go out. And he said, ask me for what you need. And he said, I want wisdom. God gives him wisdom. The timeline is going really good. Solomon's built this huge empire. It is so big and so wealthy that even the queen of Sheba came and saw it. And she was overwhelmed by it. And took people back with her. Today, there are Jews in uh, Ethiopia because of that encounter. That was the bloodline of the Jews. When she came down, she looked at everything and she took back some Jewish blood with her. 
And there's, there's Jews in Ethiopia today. But the point t- came time when the Bible says that Solomon began to bring more wives in. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Can you believe that? He was king. He'd do whatever he wanted to. But the problem wasn't just the multiple, the multi- polygamy. But the idea that most of these wives were a compromise with another king of another nation so that they could have peace. Instead of trusting God to have the power and the breakthrough and the authority, she compromised, he compromised, and began to develop a peace treaty with them. And the Bible says that these wives brought in their gods, many of them from Moab, some of them, many of them that worshiped the god of Molech. And the next thing, even though God said, do not have any, any interaction with the foreign gods, they started bringing them in. Solomon now had cut off his timeline, his trajectory. Did a lot of great things, but didn't exactly finish well. So my word to you today is, finishing well doesn't mean finishing with wealth. Finishing well means I didn't stop. I didn't get cut off. I did the, the very thing that I began was born again, brought out of darkness, and I'm still going on. It's not about what you accomplish in terms of what this world says, but did you keep going even when you felt the pain and the resistance from it all? We go through generational times and seasons. Jesus came up to the Peter, James, and John. They're fishing. And he said, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They had a choice at that moment. Do I stay with what I know or I'm going to follow him? I'm not saying quit your job. That's not the message. The Bible said immediately they left their nets and followed him. Didn't mean that they never didn't go back and ever do any fishing because they did. But he began to leave the nets and follow him. When you go after the Lord with all of your heart, mind, and strength, there's something where the Lord says, now you're on my timeline, and I'll cause everything to work according to my will and my purpose. Some of you in this room, you're either, you may be bored with God, you're upset with God, or you're blaming somebody else for whatever's going on, because things aren't going the way you want it to go. A couple of things could be there. Number one is, Acts, the third chapter, verse 19 Repent and be converted so that the times of refreshing, and the word refreshing literally resuscitation, shall come from the presence of the Lord. Repent means change the way you're thinking. And then he goes on to say, and he will make all things new again. He didn't say, I'll make all new things. The things I've already made, I'm going to make them new again. I'm going to take them back to exactly before the fall of Adam. He wants to restore to some of us before, before we mistakenly got off track, got upset, got offended, whatever it might be, and be restored back to him. And it's easy to have all kinds of reasons and excuses. I'm not this, I can't do this, and can't do that. It doesn't negate the fact is You pursue God with the family of God. It makes a big difference. All right. Let me finish up with this. Psalm says that one generation shall praise the next. I heard the Lord say yesterday, I want you to commission all of the generations today for what I'm getting ready to do. In this room are setting some most gifted people I've ever been with and seen. And I've been around enough of them, been around some, a lot of them, different states, different places, countries. But it could very well be that the enemy has blinded your eyes to see what God's put inside of you. For such a time as this. 
You're on a timeline for such a time as this. He has to, first of all, free us from ourselves to reinstate us to himself. To enlarge us, give us the capacity for what he's preparing us for, we have to get our eyes recentered upon him. Where our, na- our nation is in a terrible mess by, by the ocular side of that. People are afraid of one thing or the other. People are afraid of the political side. They're afraid this might happen, that might happen. But I can tell you that if you get so centered upon what happens, and it, and it, may, only, it may change in four years anyway, but you miss out on the fact is I've set my life aside so that it's just one, one direction. Now that doesn't mean that maybe your, maybe your position, like J, uh, Samson, is that you pray over the nation, but not just pray over the person in that White House. You pray over the freedom and the liberty that's in our nation, over the spiritual darkness that's over the nation, because of the prince and powers of darkness that go over that. So you go up higher that you've been called to war against the identity that's resisting the trajectory of our nation. Our nation has a destiny. Our nation is called to be along Israel. Our nation is called alongside of to be a support, to be a branch, if you will, that part of, uh, that's going to be grafted in, Romans 11, with Israel. And if you have a problem with Israel, you've got a problem with God. It's not a political issue. It's a problem with God. It's a biblical issue. So what happens is, you need to get on the timeline the times and the seasons, but how we inject ourselves into that, we don't get discouraged and go, don't get disconnected because of what we see, but we recognize that God has called us as a warrior or people, the sons of Issachar, we know what our job is and our job is not a person in, in the White House because that could change, but is to pull down the spiritual darkness where the alliance have been made with demonic powers in Washington, D.C. and over places. And so in order to break through, you have to war over your own, the enemies of your own timeline. You have to break through the enemy that comes to steal your own time, steal your energy, and even put something else in front of you to be distracted or be upset about something, and all of a sudden, shoop, hit the pause button. We can either pause the, the time, step out of that time, or we can move backwards, personally. I'm not talking about a clock time. I'm talking about what God would do for us. I don't want to be 10 years behind because I sat and was upset about something. I don't want to waste that kind of time. Let me give you an example. Now I'm done. Jesus came into Gennesaret. Not Nazareth, Gennesaret. And he was coming through, and the Bible says that he was looking to rest. And all of a sudden, these demons start calling out. Just, why have you come to torment us before our time? The devil knows he's on a time leash. And they know that God is in charge of the time. The times and Caesar in the Lord's hand. And this demon was not expecting Jesus to show up because you're cutting my time short. I thought I had this much time to be the afflictor in using this man. He was all chained up to have, some, have a, a, a body to operate through. Do not give yourself over to a witchcraft spirit tormenting you with mind and all kinds of things and what other people are thinking. Do not give the devil one moment of your time that short changes because your plans didn't work out like you thought they should. Time belongs to the Lord. But when we give it over to a witchcraft spirit, they're in charge of the time. And they'll continually use something to afflict, to upset, to give you a frame of reference. <coughs> I'm happy. I was just laughing just a minute ago. But I tell you what, we're going somewhere. God's called this house to be stand in the gap and push back the gates of hell. In order for me to do that, I have to make sure I'm pushing them back in my own heart. 
I cannot have authority over the enemy if I'm not, if I've given in to it myself. Now, we can leapfrog, jump way ahead in time. There's a lady, she was a Syrophoenician, remember that? She wasn't even uh, a Jewish person. And she came to Jesus and she wanted healing for her daughter. And Jesus makes a statement which was based upon the law. They were on the time frame of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And she come to Jesus, one Jew, came to Jesus and had one of those come to Jesus meetings. And so would you heal my daughter? And he said to her, quoting from the law, I cannot give the children's bread, which is healing, to the dogs. How many of you, if Jesus told you you were a dog, how far would that set you back? I didn't get the prophetic word I wanted, so therefore, I'm through. I prayed and I didn't see it happening, so I'm through. Anytime you start bargaining with God, you were never on good foundation. That's what Trish was saying. But if you're trusting him in all your ways, acknowledging all of your ways, lean not to your own understanding, then you, he'll guide your steps. Or you can delay years because you're waiting for a, ser- a scenario, certain things to happen, and they don't happen your way. You assume that didn't go the way I wanted. I want to let you know a secret here. There is very few things that I ever go through that ever go my way. Honestly, I just suit up and show up and see what happens. You don't have a vision. No, the vision is I'm going to get to the other side. I don't know if I'm going to walk on the water, swim over there, get in a boat. I don't know how I'm going to get there. All I know is I'm going to get there. When you know your end result is you're getting there, how you get there is less than. If Jesus wants to translate me and get me over there, praise God. If I've got a dog paddle, then I'm going to do it. But I am going there because I've got a word to go. When the woman replied to Jesus, not being one in covenant, she said, yes, Lord, that's true. But even the dogs get to eat the crumbs. Whatever will fall from your table is better than not having anything. Jesus was so motivated and moved by that. He said, I've never seen faith like this in all of Israel. Even among the own covenant people, I've never seen anything like this. Because she didn't respond out of offense, she responded in faith. If this moment takes me to where I'm, my daughter's going to get healed, however it comes, whether you give me the bread or falls down the dirt, whatever I need to do, I'm going to respond in like faith. I don't have to like it because if the result is what I'm looking for, I'm not going to fear. I'm still walking, walking in that timeline. I want to speak over the generations and I had to go to Pastor Frankie and help me with all the ages that go through all of that. Um, I want to pray first of all over every one of us and then we're going to put, we're going to, we're going to commission some of you. Let me ask you three questions. What caused you to be detoured from what you knew God's sending you to? And that's all different from everyone. I used to be a strong worshiper, and now I'm not so happy. They didn't play my song. Well, they probably won't until you get over it. Where Revelation 3 says, repent from where you fell. That is a picture of the old Olympiads, the Roman game, that if you were running in the Olympics and during that time, and you were running along and you got bumped off the track, you couldn't run alongside the track and just decide I'm going to get on anywhere. Repent from where you were knocked off and get back on and start again. Because the one who finishes receives a prize. Doesn't necessarily mean you finish first, but you have to finish. Can you hear the Holy Spirit tell you something happened and knocked you off, pushed you aside, and you, you've been upset ever since. Today, he wants to heal you. Second question. <laughs> Do 
Do you want to finish strong, finish high, or you want to finish low? I want to finish with a high hand, strong hand. That doesn't mean I have to finish above everybody else. It just means I need to finish without being angry. When the Bible says rejoice, and again I say rejoice, the word rejoice there doesn't mean be happy, but it means re, means join him, rejoin him. Rejoice or rejoin the Lord. And again, I say rejoin, rejoice in the Lord. Because when you rejoin him, you now have his temperament. You now have his joy. If you're all upset, that means somehow or another I've disconnected from joining him. I've joined the forces of upset, angry, offended. And the thief has come to cut your timeline off. And it's not about a particular thing that he wants you to do. It's just keep walking with him. I'm not talking about callings and gifting. You just keep walking with him. And lastly, if you know, if you know what caused you to stop, are you willing today to restart? So Father, I pray over every person that's had a bad experience in whatever church, maybe even this church, had a bad experience with people, join, we can join up with Jesus. And whatever it did that caused you to feel tainted, to feel resistant, and yet God's not called you in that way. According to Psalms 23, he restores my soul, my sanity. He restores my sanity. You're on a timeline to eternity, not just to die and go there, but you're on a timeline. So then in eternity, you stand before him and you can present, Lord, I finished by joining to you. There's a verse of scripture in Lamentations, kind of sad. He said, and it just really refers to, and all of their crowns fell off. All of the accolades and all their crowns fell off because they didn't walk, keep, continue to walk in it. Doesn't matter how good it was 10 years ago. Doesn't matter how well you were received 10 years ago. Where are you right now? This moment. I go somewhere, I don't, I don't even want them to announce any, what, anything I've done. It's where we are right now. Be present with him in the moment. Well, I remember I used to be faithful. Where are you right now? I remember I used to love the Lord, but where are you right now? I remember I used to be a worshiper, where are you right now? What happened that bewitched you? That the things start wrapping around, squeezing on you? To disrupt God's timeline. In Jesus' name, I pray over you. Uh, I'm going to ask these, these age, well, age group, you can come with anyone, but these are, these are the ones we're going to pray over. It's called the Silent Generation. Thank you, Pastor Frank, you for doing this. From 1929, 1925 to 1945, would you come stand here? The psalmist said, one generation shall praise the next. We have nobody here than that age or that, you don't want to admit it, is that it? Okay. Maybe that, you know, that 1945, we just moved a little slower. Nineteen twenty-five. I need all you guys to get together on this end down there because you'll have to make room, make room for some other generations. You weren't the only generation. <laughs> and this is my generation. I'm happy to say I was at the far end spectrum of that generation. But anyway, coming back from World War II was the baby boomers, 1946 to 64. So if you were part of that, I want you to come and line up here. Boy, our parents were busy after World War II, weren't they? <laughs> Y'all make a little bit of room between generations so I'll know who's sitting there. Thank you. And then Gen X. Gen X right down here on the other side of Tom. 
1965 to 79. It's okay, you can own it. There's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> can you believe that you were born? You were born. You were born at the time that God saw. Because the Bible says before He ever knew you, before you were ever born, He already knew you ahead of time. Amen. Gen Z, 1995 to 2009. <clears throat> Way on the other end. We're pretty much. I'm excited that we have this many different generations in the church. <clears throat> All of you are going to tell you have to make a step forward so I can get in behind you. Take one step forward to the. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Lastly. Gen Alpha, 2010 to 24. They're in children's church. They're in children's church. <laughs> also, I found out today, Pastor Frankie was telling me, Gen Alpha, no, excuse me, Gen Beta is starting in 2025. We're starting another generation. <clears throat> Here's what I want you to hear. Every generation had a part to play in our nation. And in this church right now, you play a, a strategic part. You guys that are the seniors, senior level, we're down here this end, <laughs> way down that end. <clears throat> I want you to know that we need you. You carry wisdom. You've carried the generations of breaking through. You're still standing. You're still believing God. The Bible says, do not despise the hoary head. That means white-headed, by the way. You have to say it just right. That there's a place for you, and God's saying, you're not checking out. You're just stepping in your place, and you're to bless.